Pastor Landon here, and it's time for Real Men. So uh, I hope you have your nachos. I hope you got some non-alcoholic beverages. I mean, whatever your conscience allows is fine with me. Uh, but there are people all over the globe joining us today for Real Men. It's gonna be awesome. We're growing like crazy. Um, there's people all the way in other countries watching alongside you guys tonight, as well as churches that are gathering in their buildings watching Real Men with you guys. It's awesome to have so many men across this country, across this world, joining together to grow in their faith and to be encouraged with other brothers in Christ. That's what we're called to do. That's what men in this day and age need to do um, to be good fathers, husbands, and uh, leaders in their community. So thank you for join joining Real Men today with us. Um, this series is gonna be absolutely epic. We are all about healthy masculinity and equipping men. Pastor Mark is passionate about reaching men with the gospel because when the gospel gets involved, everything gets better. We're pro-Jesus, pro-building men up, we're pro-helping men become better husbands, fathers that bless women and children. If you want to get connected and have all the updates about real men, the best way to do that is text MEN to 99383. MEN to 99383. That's not woman, that's not child, that's not baby, that's not trans. It's MEN to 99383. We'll send you tons of free resources and all kinds of stuff that'll build you up to be a better man. And if you're like my wife and you're a woman watching alongside us, you should comment below because there's actually a surprising amount of women that watch this because they want better husbands and fathers in their life and single women trying to learn what a good man is. So uh, if you want to join us in person uh, and you're a senior pastor, we would love for you to fly out, come to Real Men. Um, we'll host a dinner with Pastor Mark. You can ask all of your questions, learn how Real Men is, learn the secret sauce, and you can replicate it back in whatever state you're from. We've had people from North Carolina, South Carolina, from Texas, from Washington, from California. From Oklahoma. We have guys join us all the time. We gather together at Trinity Church in Scottsdale, Arizona, around tables where we hear an awesome teaching from Pastor Mark, what you're about to hear, and then we build each other up in small groups, um, asking some questions that are sermon based, and uh, grow together. So it's awesome, guys. And right now, it's sermon time. So get those nachos ready and get ready to dive into some real protein. You guys ready to go? Welcome back. Can you guys give a big shout out? Welcome, real men, to our new friends. We got Frank and we got Duke. Can you thank him for coming? Amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. This one's going to be fun. You guys are fun. We had dinner upstairs. You guys are a good time. This is going to be a great time. So they're going to share their testimonies, and then we're going to have a conversation wherever it goes. And if we have time at the end, uh, we'll pass the mic around if you guys have any questions for them. Sound good? All right. So who's, who's going to go first? You want to go first. You, you can go first. You're the boxer, man. We'll just defer. Okay. Well, well, first and foremost, I would like to give my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all the praise and glory for being here today. As you guys saw up on the screen, 
I started boxing at the young age of six years old, um, chasing the dream, but it wasn't just boxing I was chasing. I was um, chasing the relationship that I wanted to have with my father. And um, I came up in the 80s, so therefore I was a part of the, um, the 80s crack addiction and to where my, you know, my parents both used. So it was a shortcoming coming, coming up hard, but I was taking it as a positive way and trying to um, use boxing to stop it. And then I got good at it. So uh, I won a bunch of tournaments. So real quick, we, so you wanted your dad's like attention, approval, and he was a boxing fan. So you thought, okay, if I excel there, I'll get that attention, approval, relationship with dad. Yes, I, I was introduced to the sport by him. He was a former fighter, and my brother was a fighter. One of my brother was a fighter, and um, he he had stopped coming around when my brother stopped boxing and he started using. So I, you know, I'm seven, eight years old now. So I'm thinking like, well, I'm winning these tournaments and I'm doing this and that. It'll make him want to come and be like, oh, that's my boy, like you know, this, that, or the other. But the city was picking up on it and the different coaches, like, we really got us one. And I took that weight on my shoulders and I took it all the way up so I was able to turn professional straight out of high school to 18. And I went on to turn my professional career to 19 and over, 11 knockouts. I just had fought on ESPN, was rated number 12 in the world. And um, September 1st, 2004, I was arrested by the um, federal government for a conspiracy case. And I took it, I executed my rights and went to trial and I was given a double life sentence. So what were you ultimately convicted of? For um, distribution of um, cocaine. Um, and a double life sentence and you're a young man. Yes, sir. So fast forward from there, that had to be the darkest, most devastating moment of your life. I mean, a double life sentence, it's over. Yeah, based in a federal situation, life um, now is without parole. So my, it was a death sentence. I just had, had a two-year-old son. My parents was clean. It seemed like everything was going on track. And, you know, and I'm not here for um, no compassion or nothing because I did break the law. Um, but a double life sentence was um, evidently it was what I needed because it changed my life. You know, it changed my outlook on things. And I had a relationship with God, but this right here took me to a whole nother level. I was never been in handcuffs, and I was sent to um, a maximum security prison where they hold the worst prisoners in the world. And how long were you in for? I did 16 years, six months, and 21 days. And, uh, I mean, just practically, I mean, we all have our sort of concepts if we've not been there. But how do you survive in that environment? I mean, being a boxer is probably helpful, but what else gets you through it? I mean, some of my, I, like I said, I believe, but I believe that my relationship that I built up in the process of fighting the case, um, I had, I was fighting and trying to do things to save so many people outside of my family at a young age some of those people wasn't there for me doing it. It took them two years to take me to trial, then another two years before they sentenced me. So I did four years like in the county, and based on the case, I was like in the hole the whole time. So I, I wasn't around people, I didn't go outside. Um, I didn't go up, I mean, I didn't even go up a flight of stairs. So I had to really get a relationship with God because that's all who I had to talk to. I believe that God allowed certain people that I wanted to be in my life and support me at that time to be moved aside. And that feeling was worse than the life sentence because it's like all these things I've done, I've done it for you and then you're not even with me. But it was for me to get that one-on-one -on -one with God to get prepared to go to the federal prison where it's a whole different community to where everything's to solve with violence. And um, I was able to go in there with a straight head, with a vision to stay out of trouble, but to stand my ground, as well as to try to get
get some of the young men and old men as well as keep a relationship with my son because that was my number one priority. I refuse to go to be just a picture on the wall to my two-year-old son that I had left, no matter what mistakes I had made. And um, I believe wholeheartedly God heard that prayer from me from day one because I didn't pray to get let go. I didn't pray to, you know, get a slap on the back because I was a fighter. I knew I broke the law. I knew that I had to get punished. But I prayed that God give me a relationship with my son and don't let me lose that. And he knew I was sincere and bold about that. And, and, and it worked. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. So part of what I'm hearing in your story, there was rejection by your parents. And not that they didn't um, love you, but because of the addiction, they weren't present and available. Um, you know, we talked earlier that it was your viewpoint is like, it's a disease and my parents weren't doing well, but there is rejection there. And then you get arrested and you get incarcerated and certain people don't come to visit. There's rejection there. Um, do you think that that helped really push you to make sure that your son didn't feel rejected by his father? A hundred percent. And it's, and, and even to all you men out here today, um, whoever experienced drugs of any such type, whether even if it's medication from the doctor to uh, you abused it, I want to apologize to you because at one point I was a man that was bringing drugs into a community that made some children feel like how I felt. I went to sleep not eating some nights. I went, I went through rejection because of that disease. So as a man in the new man, I want to apologize to you or whoever went through it or whatever family member because that's the best way to start things off by asking for forgiveness. Um, we love you and we're honored to have you. And for the guys that are here and they, you know, they've made some sins, some mistakes, some errors, they're in a difficult or a dark place, you talked about kind of building that relationship with God that kept you sane. Practically, what did that look like for you and for a guy who maybe he did grow up in church or knowing God, but he's really got himself in a tough place or made some bad decisions. What does that look like practically to get moving? Who are we to judge? We, we can't judge nobody. Um, you, you can have two-parent household. I mean, look at the, the lost son. You know, he, when he came home, the father was so happy to see him, he stirred away. So with that being said, it's, it's just once you decide and know what you are as a man and what you are going to do to provide, to take care of your community, for your family, as your duty and responsibility, that's when you can say that you're a man. Other than you're just a grown boy. We, ca we call them boys who can shave. The boys who can shave. So take us back to uh, federal, federal prison, double life sentence. Apparently something happened because, you know, you're here. So between there and, and here, what's the rest of the story? Well, when I, one thing that I could say is, you know, like I said, I was, I was sent to USP Terror Hut. The first day there was a murder. I walked down the yard. We got locked up. I'm in the visiting room. I actually able to touch because I didn't get to touch my son for um, like almost five years. I visited through a TV screen. So he would touch the screen and act like he touching my face. I never got to hug him or nothing like that. Um, that was the way that the prosecutor wanted to make the case. Like I was just a, you know, a minister or whatnot. But make a long story short, we on visit and they locked down. I'm like, what's going on? They was like, oh, it's been a murder. You know, we got to lock down. We got to protect the jail. So I'm like, oh, Lord, what, what am I into? You know, so I'm like, um, but make a long story short, I just I prayed, and there was this program. I, I'll get the program. I'm reading it on this lockdown, and it's for people that are, are um, that basically you got the USP, the medium, the low, and the camp being the the camp being the um, small as far as your background, as far as in, in, in the amount of time you got. But you got some people in the USP that might be only got three years, but they may be a violent 
or ex-offender. Um, so they have to have this program there. It's called the Life Connection Program. It's a faith-based program, but it's for people that's going home. So I went and got the brochure and filled out for it. So everybody laughed. I'm like, you got two life citizens. What you taking this program for? I said, I'm not, I'm not going to be in here forever, you know. So I want to, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe that. I'm, not, I'm never saying that. So, <clears throat> but um, it's a motion that I'm pretty sure the attorney, the attorney will know about this. I lost my 2255, which is your ineffective assistant counsel. And I just know I'm finna win this one. Like, this lawyer, like. I, I really want to see him to this day, but that's another topic. But I lost it. Knocked the wind out of me. I said, now nah, it's real. Now I'm seeing all these guys that in the 20 years, 30 years, and they walking around sad with their head down, having no vision, no hope. They don't get mail. They don't They have nothing. I said, no, nah, I can't do that. But in that program, I took that program serious. And I took that program like I was finna get out in two years. And I learned the twos, extra twos that no man never taught me. Because as the age of eight years old, I had people that was older than me that I looked up to, but I didn't look up to them for advice. They never said, Hun, learn this. The only thing I was ever taught was boxing. And even in boxing, I watched the film, I watched the other fighters, and I tried it myself. So. With that being said, that program taught me something. And, and, uh, and there was an older guy. He said, you, you self-rehabilitating, son. You ain't going to die here. He said, um, and he actually, he said, I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to die here, but not you. So you remember that. And I took care of him the whole time. And, but, but that program changed my life. It gave me the tools. It taught me how to be a father. It was a big thing because we had this um, program inside of there called Inside Outside Dads. So I took that so serious to where the, the outside contractors took my paper and posted it. Worst thing they could have did, came and locked me up for it. So I said, I just wrote the paper. But they were so sincere about how I felt about my son and at the amount of time that I had. So I used, I learned to use every tool I wrote them. Um, I wrote his mom, I called, um, I, whoever was coming that way, I said, well, you know, you could do me a favor if you could bring my son. You know, I used every tool to be in his life. And not only him, but some of his friends who don't have fathers to where they think I'm their dad now. They call me pops and all of that now to this day because that's what we got to do. That's awesome. So how'd you get out and how did you kind of restore and rebuild the relationship with your son? Okay, well, another thing hit me with a gut shot in 2016. Um, right before then, the Obama administration started a, they called it the drug minus two at first to where if you was a nonviolent drug, drug offender and hadn't been in trouble, you could get two points knocked off the guidelines, and you can maybe come home to that. Because this was your first offense? My, yes. But on top of it, he started doing clemencies for the, um, for the crack cases and different cases based on African Americans. He letting people left to go. It's a prongs that you had to go by. Nonviolent, no um, no um, problems inside of prison. You have been down X, X amount of years. I fed every prong on there. My co-defendant, who had 20 years, received it, but I was denied it. So then my faith was so strong then, though. If I, I felt the punch, but it didn't knock me down like the 2255, and I refused to allow it. But I said, it's just ain't time for me to go yet. And I talked to God that night, and I said, if it's meant for me to spend the rest of my life in here, what do you, you leaving me around a bunch of men, what do you want me to do with these guys, including with my son? And... I promise you, I heard God talk to me. He said, get up and write down what you want me to do. And I didn't write down, let me go. But everything else I wrote down on that paper, I checked off. 
it came upon to where I had another dream and I was picked to do this. Um, they picked like 5,000 inmates and I was picked to do it on about, about clemency's importance, saying how it's not being feared, the process is going. So they used me. I write this story and tell this guy, I said, President Trump gonna let me out. I'm not filing no more motions, I'm not doing anything. So they send me a lawyer on the first step back. He said, well, we don't think you're gonna get it, Tanner, but they sent me to represent you because you got, you got crack cocaine, but the powder overrides it, so they kind of got you in both ways. I said, don't worry about it, you ain't even gotta call up here no more. So <laughs> I didn't file the motion, but I wasn't being funny. It goes back to the story of Joseph, and that's why I read it. If you guys remember the three guys that was locked up with him, they got out. They said, I'm going to remember you. I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to go do that. So I had all these people saying how they're going to take my case here or there. I wrote to the White House once a month. I sent a letter about my case. I wrote all the advocates that was going on. Some wrote back, some different. It was a lady that got hold of my case, never talked to me, never wrote me back, but she was working. I'm laying down in my bed, October 21st, 2020. They got us on lockdown, so I'm like, something happened. So about two hours later, they come. Tanner, come on, let me talk to you in the back. I know I had done nothing, but I know the routine. So as soon as I go to the back, I get to take my shirt off. Scripture is time. It's like, calm down, say, you got to hear up and get me out here because I don't be in the back talking to you guys because it's make it like you, you snitching or whatnot. He said, no, nah, man, we got to get you out of here. I said, where I'm going? He said, you're going home. The president signed off on your clemency. It was on the TV. We had to lock the jail down. One, one hour later, I was in a hotel room. Six hours later, I got to hug, hug, hug my son for the first time outside of jail. And he, he was 18, was he 18 at the time? He was 18. Just first like, time you ever hugged your son? No. Outside, outside of the prison. Of prison since he was two years old. So his only experience with his dad, you know, physically giving him a hug or touching him, was in a prison. It's a different hug from, from you got a guy telling me you hugging him too long. Let him go. He can't sit on my lap. He couldn't sit on my lap in jail because you got sex offenders in there and they molest the kids. So therefore now the kids can't sit on your lap. What would you say to the dads that are here and they can hug their kids, but they don't do it enough? Uh, that's, that's one of the most, the best things you can do is hug your child, tell them you love them. I mean, they going to feel something. Not even your child. Somebody that ain't got a kid need to hug more than your own son do. And that's what me and this brother... That's how we became so like, cause our vision on that, it, it's the same. Cause it ain't just about our kids. So talk about um, your current relationship with your son and then spiritual fathering. You're of an age now where you've, you've got that sort of fatherly mantle and you get to use that to be a spiritual father to other young men. But tell us first about your son. Well, we got the best relationship ever. When I came home, I did a lot of interviews. And to me, that was our counselor. Um, he got to say things that he went through and I learned that I didn't know. And he learned more things about me. Some was good, some was bad, but he got to hear me say it. Um, I'm finna get married um, December 30th and that's my best man. On the, on the spiritual, spiritual aspect, you know, he watched me 
from the things that he heard about me and to what people think about me to where he know, like, even when his friends are around and we go to a restaurant and hang out, he'd be like, hold up, don't eat yet. My dad going to pray first. You know what I mean? List little things like that that you have to instill in them and you slowly give it to them because it's a whole new nightmare out there. The devil is doing his job, so we gotta do ours. So therefore, we gotta learn our children. We gotta learn what they like, so therefore, we can learn a few things. I'm learning how to play a video game because maybe at the video game, I could get his attention a little bit instead of telling him to cut the video game off and listen to what I'm saying. So maybe if I play the video game with him and talk to him, he can hear some of what I'm not saying. And my, my thing is to lead by actions, and my legs match my lips. And that's, that's, that's my best advice. And it still might not be me to give him what he need. It might be Frank, it might be you, it might be somebody else. But we got to be men and not be scared to talk to other men and help them. God made us. We just help them develop each other. And we all got that job to do. Um, last question. Um, talk about spiritual fathering and now the young men that don't have a dad or have a good father present in their life, they're finding you and it's your son's buddies are finding you. Um, as soon as a, a man raises his hand and says, I care, I'm available and I'm not going to judge you. What kind of guys show up, young guys show up? It's still the, the way the message is given. A lot of kids now from me seeing since I've been home, my neighborhood, for me to tell some of them little dudes I love them, they ain't never heard that before, and it's sad. And it makes them come around and they want to hear more. It's your words that started. You know, we got to have something to give them too. But it's start with the words. So um, maybe in closing, you've got a, a ministry. You're actively trying to help spiritually father young men. What does that look like and where could they find out more about that? Well, I'm starting a program that I know what helped change me and grow me. And it took a life sentence and for me to lose a lot of things. I didn't come home to my parents. They had passed away. So my thing is a lot to do with the prison system. I have so many different ideas with it. So I got a, a LLC called the Duke of Freedom, and I'm in the process of writing a book called Relationship Behind Bars, and it's to help teach the outside on what to do to help the guys from the inside because we have to have these men and women coming out better than what they went in. And right now, the justice system stinks. It's not doing any help. You could go look up, I came home from Allenwood, and you guys try this. Go look in your phone and look how it look. The bed made, wooden bed, you get two burgers. It don't look like that. It's three men in that room, in that room that only two men are supposed to be in. It's no programs to, to, to do it. You got to self-do it. So therefore, do we allow these type of guys to come home and be around our children? It, it's, it's the example that I use on the medicine. It's what the justice system is doing. And it's like if you have a sickness and you go to the doctor and they give you some medicine, okay, it's supposed to heal it and go away. But if they don't give you the right doses, you got to come back and get a stronger doses. But if they give you too much of a dose, it can kill you or even leave you with a disability. That's what's happening in the system. The guys is getting too much time for the crimes. I'm not saying I'll be punished. And guess what? If you didn't get it right the first time, he'll be back. And you give him a little stronger medicine. But when you give a guy too much, like in my situation, but by the grace of God, I was covered with the blood. It didn't kill me or give me a disability. It made me stronger. But everyone isn't believing. Everyone don't believe because their hope is gone. 
So with that being said, we have to come together as a collective, as a whole, to make it better. So therefore, on the outside, we got to come back and put something back into the system. The Bible said if he hungry, feed him. If he's sick, pray for him. If he in jail, go visit him. How many men been inside of a jail to visit their friend or family member to tell them it's going to be okay? You messed up, learn from your state, read this book. We like you. Thank you for joining us, buddy. Praise yeah. God. Uh, all right, Frank, you've been patient. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're glad to have you, and it's an honor to hear your story and what God's doing. If you're willing, share your testimony. Encourage the guys. Well, first of, first of all, thank y'all for having us, man. We, anytime we get an opportunity to speak, it's humbling. Um, to see a group of men in here that's praising God, I mean, full of power and energy. I know the words say many plans are in a man's heart, but it's the Lord plan that will stand. So you take what's in your heart and stand it against what the Lord says and see what stands and what's fall. See, I know you read up on the board there, um, you know, playing in the NFL and things of that nature, and you heard Pastor talk about the 422, but that ain't that ain't what I want you to know me as today. I want you to know me as a man that never gave up. Because every man in this room going to have an opportunity to give up. The question is, will you give up? Will you give up? It's going to take boldness for you to survive out here. We in it now. It's going to take boldness for you to stand for something. And I'm honored and I'm thankful First of all, to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Second of all, for having an opportunity that I'm not taking like an obligation. I'm not obligated to be up here. Oh, here we go again speaking. No, this is an opportunity to build something. To see if I can touch you in such a way where your faith get built. You know, my story, we can go right into it like you said, Pastor. But my story, you know, growing up in Jacksonville, Florida, um, I found myself, you know, with both parents, great mom, preach the word, throw oil on you, pray for you, whatever you need. <laughs> My daddy was a hardworking Georgia boy. I'm talking about he'll hunt, he'll fish, but he didn't understand father, fatherhood. All he wanted to do was work. And I never forget one day I was on the way home. My mom just started letting me go outside and I got bullied. And from that day, I took a fake ID. Everybody know what a fake How, ID is? I think we were talking, you were about 11 at that time? I was about 11 years old. Okay. And I tapped into a fake ID. And a fake ID is a picture of you, but everything on there a lie. And I tapped into that fake ID. I started to sell drugs. I started to run trap houses. I started to carry firearms. See, my dad taught me how to hunt, but my family members in the street tried to teach me how to kill. There's a big difference. And I didn't know no better. So that fake ID began to follow me everywhere I go. I started to do those things. And then I found myself incarcerated at the age of 15, facing 10 to 15 years. What was the charge? Um, armed robbery, gun charges, um, drugs. Um, and you can't even drive. Oh, legally. I was driving. The thing about it, I was driving. <laughs> I had I had three cars back then, <laughs> without a license. <laughs> with with my cousin and the influence they had on me, I thought that was the way. I thought that's the only way I could survive in the community that I was in at the time. My mom and the dad was a little green, so they didn't know the neighborhood was getting bad. They had no no clue. Um, when I walked into that jail, I could smell how stink it was. I, I see the chip of the paint peeling off. I knew this wasn't a place for me. And when I walked in and, and that judge looked me in the eye when I went to court, he said, you're a menace to society. And my mom dropped and began to cry. And, and I knew, I say, man, this, this is it. This is it for me. All my dreams of playing in the NFL, all my dreams of ever going to college to be the star player I want is over. And when I went back to my cell, um, time went by. And I never forget going, they let us out to the yard to play basketball. Um, and I was playing basketball. And, and when everybody got done, they made me stay. 
Um, they say, Frank, stay, wait, wait a minute, want to talk to you. And it was a, another man up top in the guard. They came down and that guard looked at me and said, um, this guy want to talk to you. He's a coach. And the coach said, man, I don't know what charges you got, but if you ever get out of here, we'll give you a full ride to our high school. And he said, because you got the talent to be an NFL player or an NBA player. Y'all, nobody ever told me that in my life. I went back to the cell. I started doing push-ups, sit-ups. <laughs> I took the mat and started squatting the mat. I was like, man, this is, I got, our, they's like, what you doing, Frank? I say, man, I'm going to the NFL. They, they like, boy, you know where you at? <laughs> you in jail. And, and I, I, I say, no, I'm going to the NFL. And as time passed by, um, you know, it was getting ready for trial. And my mom said, hey, um, I've been praying for you. God told me you're going to do great things. You're going to travel the world. You're going to do great things. Um, don't take this time. They offered me time. And I say, I'm going to take it, Mom, because, you know, I, I got to get out of here. And um, she say, God don't want you to do that. I say, I'm tired of God talking to you. Can he talk to me too? <laughs> so I was like, God, show me. Talk to me. Let me know. And, and I had a dream that I won trial. So I went to my lawyer and I say, hey, uh, I, I, I'm going to go to trial. He said, you sure? I say, yeah, I'm going to trial. So correct me if I'm wrong. You were 15, but they were going to try you as an adult. Yeah, my charge was already tried as an adult. Um, and when I went to trial, I won trial. Just like the dream said. And you guys, this is something you have to realize. It's something they call residue. Um, and when I got out in one trial, the residue followed me, though. The mind shape of what happened when I, when I was incarcerated at a young age, what happened, what I learned in my environment. So I got out, went back to school. I had one high school year. That's it. And I was an All-American in that one year, runner-up Mr. Florida, MVP offensive player in the state of Florida. And I went to a junior college in Mississippi, and I kept saying my life going to change. I can't get in trouble. I can't get in trouble. I had no mentor. I had no father. My father looked me in the face and said, boy, this ball ain't going to take you nowhere. And when he told me that that, that, that that was just a discouragement, so I was out to prove him wrong. How, how old were you when you are we talking about upstairs? How old were you when you first heard your dad say that he loved you? We were talking about that. And for both of you men, there's a theme here where if you have a, a non-relational, non-encouraging dad, sports is a way for a young man to try and get his father's attention and approval. Uh, but even if you don't get it after that, it's just kind of hopeless and discouraging. So how old were you when your dad said, I love you, son? He never told me that until I got older, until I actually became a grown-up. You know, at, at the end of the day, he never emptied his cup. And I tell a lot of men in here, man, empty your cup. It's full of hurt, pain, speculation from your past. If you don't empty your cup, you're going to bring your son that same cup. And I'm encouraging you, empty the cup. And that's why we here to help you fill it up with encouragement, empowerment, truth, so you can see the light of day. He never emptied that cup. And it, and it played on me because I went on to Mississippi and I was saying to myself, don't get in, don't get in trouble, don't get in trouble. And I ended up getting in trouble again, carrying firearms and start selling drugs at campus because that's all I knew how to do. And the coach called my mom and said, hey, this boy got to go. I, don't, I mean, he can't stay here. And the, my mom said, if, you, if he come back home, he's going to die. Could you please help him? She's crying on the phone. And he said, I think I got another place for him. And the coach accepted me in Kansas. So I was on the bus heading to Kansas Junior College to get another opportunity. And I was on the bus saying, man, I don't want to get in no trouble. I'm going to get in trouble. It wasn't no more than two months. I was right back in trouble taking that fake ID, that residue followed me. I started selling drugs, carrying firearms again. I found myself incarcerated facing another 15 years in college. And I thought it was over. And I got bonded out. And I sat down with the president of the college. That president of the college said, you will never touch this field again, ever. But we cannot kick you out of school because you can sue us because you haven't been found guilty. Frank, you have a 0 0.1 grade point average. Can you focus on that? I say, shoot, I might as well. I went back to school. And you guys know coaches would talk to me. Every time I try to speak to the coach, they turn their head and walk the other way. No students would talk to me, so I was all alone. And I walked down this hall one day. This is the way I go every time. And I walked down this hall, and I heard a voice say, 
hey, young man. And I turned around. It was a janitor. And the janitor said, you come this way all the time, and it's a light over your head. God told me to tell me you're going to change the world, and, and you're going to turn some team around. I said, lady, I go to trial in two weeks. It don't look good. The team don't even like me. The coach don't like me. They kicked me off the team. What are you talking about? And I started to walk off, and she said, no, come here. Will you hang with me a little bit? Will you go somewhere with me? I said, go where? She said, go to church. I said, man, you sound like my mama. Here we go again with the church stuff. And then she said, no, trust me. Will you go with me? And I said, sure. From that day, she started to mentor me. It wasn't a man. It wasn't some popular athlete. It was a janitor. And I ask y'all today, will you be a janitor? Will you be a janitor to the next generation that's looking up to you? Will you be a janitor to your son? Will you be a janitor to his friends? Because without her, I wouldn't be here today. She took me to her house and started to mentor me, started to pray over me, tell me this, what's wrong with you? Your heart is hurting. Your heart is bitter. She, I say, what is bitterness? She started explaining it to me. And you guys, I went to trial and I won trial again. God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, fifth chances. I end up going back to the coach and say, I'm ready to play. And he was like, man, we just really think you should leave. I say, <laughs> I, say I got a 3.2. I took my grade point average to an 0.1 or whatever to a 3.2. And I, the head coach say, let him stay. We already got an All-American running back. He ain't going to make the team anyway. Let him stay. I can't, went home, you guys. I started to work out. And that's why I say it's going to take boldness to, to the dream you believe in, young man. Whatever dream you believe in, it's going to take boldness. When they tell you it's over, it's going to take boldness. We can't let your purpose go to the graveyard because we let your purpose go to the graveyard. We didn't just cheat us. We cheated the next generation. And that's why we're here. I went back home and the first call I got was my older cousin. I'm saying, hey, we heard what happened. You need some money. Come sling some dope. Come hang with us. I said, "Nah." for the first time in my life, I got a job. I went to Winn-Dixie Warehouse and I worked my butt off. <laughs> I, I printed out a Florida State workout book and I did every workout on there to the T every day I was at that track. And man, I cramped up from the top of my head to my toes and I almost died. I almost died, literally. The ambulance came, my mama yelling, throwing oil on me. Jesus! I said, I need water! <laughs> She's throwing oil on me. I'm like, I need water. And you guys, every time I got a call late at night, every time I got a call late at night to come hang out, I would hang with the phone, get my headphone sets, go to the track and run. Every time I got a call, I'll go to the track and run. Because I said, I'm going to be great. I got back to the college. The running back that, that was an All-American got kicked out. That moved me to the starter. I took the team to the national championship, won the MVP of the national championship, was the number one recruit in the nation, won the Heisman Trophy of all the junior colleges, got voted junior college player of the year, Got inducted to the Junior College Hall of Fame all in one year, just like Miss Cheryl, the janitor, said. And, and if you tell me God can, can't do it for you. I went on to Kansas State and um, broke some records there and got drafted into the NFL. Um, I got a chance to be around a powerful coach. His name is Coach Tony Dungy. I've I never seen character before, you guys. I got in the locker room, and I, I watched them. And I say, man, we played bad one game, you guys. I'm talking about bad. And I say, oh, here we go. We finna get cussed out. Coach Dungy finna cuss us out like every coach does. He came in the locker room, was the same guy when he left out. Guys, here's the plan. This is what we're going to do. I was like, this guy's different. I began to watch every movie made. That was my first time seeing what character looked like and integrity looked like. And I wanted it. That motivated me. And my same dad that was saying that ball ain't going to change your life, he was like, when am I going to get my boat? <laughs> <laughs> I was buying him boats and telling him I love him. He never would tell me I love He never told me he loved me. And I say, I'm going to keep working on you. Every day I come home, every day I come back from playing the game, I say, hey, I love you, man. 
he just turned his head and said, okay. I said, oh, man. I said, I'm not going to quit till I hear this. One day I came home, we lost a game, and I was looking out the window, and I heard a small, still voice say, son, you can pray farther than you can see. Because I was worrying about things that I can see, but my prayers can go a lot farther. And the next day I walked up to him and said, Dad, I love you. I was getting ready to walk off because, you know, I'm thinking he just finna ignore me again. He said, I love you too. It changed my life. And I know a lot of people in the room, you may be asking yourself, you know, where is my life? And I'm, and I'm going to help you. Colossians 3.3 3 says, your life is with Jesus, but hidden in God. And see, a lot of y'all searching for your life, but it's hidden in God. See, here's the trick. When something's hidden in God, it says, but you must be with who? Jesus. See, a lot of y'all been coming with your own strength and getting denied every time you try to see your life. Some of y'all been coming with your education. You get denied because you can't see your life. Some of y'all coming with your pride. Some of y'all coming with your friends. Every time you come without Jesus, you get denied to see your life, which is hidden in God. Well, here's an opportunity today for you to see your life. Because if you come with Jesus, you get granted access on the inside to see your life that's hidden in God. Amen. Today is your day to see your life. You haven't lived your best life yet. You think you have. You think you have. I, I know what, I, I, anybody know Peyton Manny, Tom Brady? I, I was, um, Peyton called me one day and he's like, um, hey, Frank, come to the field, man. I need to catch a little bit. And I'm like, man, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. He said, I'm going to bring another quarterback. I say, man, I'm good. Whatever you want to do, I can run all day. I was like, dog, I get to the field and there go Peyton Manning and then Tom Brady walking out. I say, man, I'm finna catch for the two of the best quarterbacks to ever play the game. And Peyton, I noticed something about him, man. He say, Frank, if you get right there, not to the left, not to the right, but not two yards, he'll go right on that spot, I'll get you the ball every time. Tom's like, just get in the spot. <laughs> and, and Peyton, every time I was in that spot, you guys, I caught that ball. And see, some of y'all not in the right position. The ball is being thrown, but you're in the wrong position. You know why you're in the wrong position? Because you're listening to the wrong thing. You're listening to self instead of listening to the Holy Spirit. When I learned how to hear the Holy Spirit, every time he told me what position to get in, I caught the ball. So you want to know why I, be, how I became this man to put down drugs? To put down guns, to put down violence, I invited the Holy Spirit to live inside of me continually and order my steps. And every time he ordered my steps, I made it out alive. And it's going to take boldness for you today to get in tune with the Holy Spirit. Because, see, we forgot about the Holy Spirit. I remember Coach say, you never play, Coach Dungeon say, you never played receiver before. But I want you to learn from Keyshawn Johnson, because he's big like you. I want you to learn from Joey Galloway, because he's fast like you. And I want you to learn from Keenan McCardell. Now, when he said Keyshawn Johnson, I was like, woo, he popular. So I'm a little, you know, he popular. And when he said Joey Galloway, oh, he popular. When he said Keenan McCardell, I was like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, that's the same thing we doing. God, he's popular. Jesus, we all say it, he popular. Holy Spirit, uh, uh. <laughs> And I'm here to tell you that Keenan McCardell was a better receiver than both of them. He taught me everything about the receiver position. And I'm telling you, you got to stop replacing the Holy Spirit because God gave you the vision. Jesus approved that vision by his blood. And then the Holy Spirit is there to help you complete the vision. But if you keep putting yourself in the place of the Holy Spirit, it never get completed. And it goes to the graveyard. There's many pastors that are supposed to be doing what pastor doing right now, but their purpose went to the graveyard. A lot of athletes supposed to be doing what we're doing right now, but their purpose went to the graveyard. The reason why we're here is to stop your person purpose from going to the graveyard. Jesus never intended your purpose to go to the graveyard. 
That's why he left and left the Holy Spirit because he knew that was the only thing that could direct your path to the successful place that he called you to be. I feel like I should call you Pastor Frank. <laughs> you, got a, you got a preacher in you, man. No, I'll just tell you, like yes, I, I do this for a living. You've got a preacher. <laughs> um, so l- let me ask you this question. Um, for the dads that are like, you know, I don't say I love you or I'm not, I mean, for you, it's, uh, it's physical affection and hugging your son and being physical and present. And for you, it was your dad being verbal and telling you he loved you. What about for the guys here who are like, I'm not very verbal, I don't say a lot. You know, my kids know I love them because I go to work and I feed them. But how, how powerful is it? I mean, at that point, you're a world-class professional athlete and the words of your father as a grown man still have the greatest authority to heal and to encourage of any man on planet earth. Maybe just explain to the fathers the importance of putting blessing on their sons. All things work together for those who love God. And what I learned from my dad, you know, he's not perfect. And I had to take the expectations off him because nobody can love me like God. And see, my dad didn't understand the love of God. I did. So I took those, that, that expectation that I love so hard and I put that expectation on him and he couldn't handle it. And if we take the expectation off people and just love like God did, he'll bring them around. So they'll love on their own level. They level don't look like your level. I mean, I run a 422. Ain't too many people can run a 422. I can't run that on a motorcycle. <laughs> So I stopped having that expectation on my dad and I put that expectation on my faith. So my faith expectation was that my dad would say one day he loved me. Now, God, go do what you do. I did. I didn't move faith out the way and get in fear and say, Dad, why you ain't doing this? Why you ain't doing that? I want to see that. That's fear. I put faith on God, what he said and put him to the test. And he did what he always do. He come through. Not when you want him, but he come through on time. That's what I learned. So tell us how things ended with your dad. Because your dad's passed away, correct? My dad passed away. Um, I was blessed. I, I played for um, Miami, Coach Saban. The first year he was there at Coach Saban. 2006, that's a long time ago, but you know who Coach Saban is. And I, I went to Miami, and I'm, I'm balling. This is my first. I mean, I'm having a great camp, you guys. I'm, I'm catching everything. I move up the depth chart to, like, third, third string, and I was the last receiver to even come into the camp. And Coach Saban calls me in the office, and he says, um, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to release you because you was the last receiver here, and I don't think it's fair to the other guys. I was like, Coach, this ain't college. This is the NFL. You're going to have to release everybody but six receivers anyway, the best six. And something in my spirit say, be quiet and tell them thank you. I say, Coach Saban, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I walked out the office. The receiver, Coach say, get ready for practice. Where you going? I say, Coach Saban just released me. He turned red, ran into the office. They're yelling back and forth. He come back out. He say, man, he, he, st- he still got that college mentality. I, I don't know what to say, Frank. Man, I'm sorry. I packed my stuff up and I'm driving home and I called my pastor and say, hey, I'm headed to Tampa. I'm heading back to you and I'm um, ready to get started on what we was doing. You know, I hung up the phone. I began to pray. The Holy Spirit said, go to Jacksonville. I called my pastor back. I say, listen, Holy Spirit telling me to go to Jacksonville. He said, well, you better go. <laughs> you better go wherever he tell you. I crossed the Jacksonville line and I get a call as my mom. Right when I crossed the Jacksonville line, she said, your dad's dying. He's in the hospital. He's going to die. We, we don't, it's over. I say, I just crossed the Jacksonville line. It ain't over. I'll be there. I drove up in my Benz. I left my Benz park running with all my stuff in it, jewelry, clothes. I ran into the hospital. All my family in the room, I told them, could they leave? And my mama was walking out with them. I said, mama, you stay. 
And I say, Dad, you want to live? He say, yes. I put hands on him and pray for him. He lived five more years. Sometimes, listen, listen, guys. Sometimes it ain't what your daddy can do for you. It's what you're going to do for him. You got to get your selfishness out the way. You're self-centered. Because when it's self-centered, God ain't in the center no more. It's you. You can't think like God. Your little thinking, your little brain, it can't, it can't, you live in a fantasy. <laughs> thinking you can outthink him. You know, fan is short for fantasy. When I used to stand back and get ready for a kick return, them fans cheering. And I'm like, ooh, this feel good. The minute I get hurt and they put somebody else back there, they clap it just as loud. I say, what y'all doing? <laughs> I ain't back there. But no, they was living a fantasy through me. And they just lived a fantasy through him. And I, you shouldn't let nobody live a fantasy through you. And that's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to be in fantasy land. He wants you to duplicate what your daddy did. You got to break that generational curse. And it's your day. It's your time. And I had to do that. Because now my sons look up to me. My sons tell me how proud they are. Man, they hear all these stories about me. And it's like, oh, dad, you, you got a lot of opportunities. You got a lot of chances. I was like, son, that's why I've written the book. So you don't have to need those many chances. And my sons begin to say that I'm their hero. Man, y'all know how that feel? I, I, I was just doing what God called me to do. And I'm here today only because... God didn't just call me, he chose me. And see, when you know that, man, they, not, the devil shouldn't be able to even shake you because all y'all was chosen. That's why you're here today. Y'all remember the lady at the well? I'm going to give you one good story. The feel, lady at the free, well. Feel free, Pastor Frank. You just do one more. Uh, <laughs> good job, Pastor Frank. You, you, want, you want me to tell them or you want me to... Want me to no, go ahead, buddy. Okay. And then I, wanna, I just want to hear, did your dad get saved? My dad got saved um, before that. Okay. And my mom was working on him. And then when I came in the picture, it was just solidified. So, yes, he, he, he did get saved. And uh, the story I just felt encouraged to tell you guys, because I just want to tell y'all that y'all at the right place. It's just something keep tugging on me, and, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm sorry. Y'all at the right place at the right time. And the woman at the well, I, I like to tell this story because it, it does something to uh, me every time. The woman at the well was sinning. We all know, sleeping around, doing everything wrong, lying. She get to the well. She go at the hottest point of the day. Why she go at the hottest point of the day? Because nobody's there to see her. So she can get all water and go. But guess what? Jesus showed up at the hottest point of the day to meet her there. He told his disciples to stay back. And when he met her there, uh, they began to conversate, having conversations. And, and, and she began to lie. And he said, you don't have to lie. From that day, she realized that it wasn't just her flesh that brought her there. It was her faith because she always saying that she was going to meet the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Your faith brought you here today for a divine appointment with Jesus Christ to hear something that's going to change your life as a man, as a father, and as a leader. Not just of your house, but of your community and this country. And you got to believe that. Because it's men that look like us that even looks like you. And they crying for you to help them. They crying for you to get in your rightful position. See, this ain't just a men's group. What is your rightful position that you've been missing? What position you've been out of because you're in fear? Because you're worrying about what somebody else going to say. Well, your son not only depending on you, but that young man around the corner is dependent on you. It's your time. So let's close with this, and thank you, men, very much. Um, tell them about your... Um, yeah, you could, be, you could be somewhere else doing something else. Thank you for being here, and thank you for giving us permission to distribute. Um, just a little bit then about, this is a good transition, your ministry, kind of what you're doing, where they can find you, and how you're trying to help father, and that's both of your hearts, is to spiritually father young men. Um, I wrote a book called The Man Behind the Helmet, God of Second Chances. 
Um, I wrote that book and I asked Coach Dungey to forward it. And and funny story, I, I, he said, "Well, Frank, you know, you know, I I, I kind of don't really do that because you know people can get in trouble after he forward the book." And I understood that. He said, "You can at least send me a copy." So I emailed him a copy. He calls me back and say, "I gotta forward this book. <laughs> I got to." And um, I was very humble and thankful. The book, um, we're now seeking to turn it into a movie because we want to get this message out of redemption, sec- God of second chances, the unforgiving God, the grace of God, so our young people can be drawn. We also do programs uh, for prisons, and I do programs for the youth, the next generation. We're looking to build a school, and in that school, we're going to have complexes. We're going to have different things to try to attract them to work on their life skills because that's what's missing a lot of life skills. So we got a digital curriculum um, as well out. And you can go to my website, um, www.frankdmurphy.com. That's frankdmurphy.com. And it'll tell you more information, how to donate, how to help, how to see what we're doing. We also do athletes um, with purpose conferences. We come to different towns, we get with the church and we do camps with them. And then we do, I bring speakers in and we do mentorship. Cause we know athletes, are are one of the best ways to to be a role model to kids. They look up to that. So we use that as to to try to hook them and bring them in um, to a better opportunity other than what the streets are telling them. Because you got to remember the streets will um, draw you in. The streets will tell you that they love you, but the streets will send you back home to your mama dead in a casket. And that's, that's all they got. That's all they know. So, yeah, go to my website, find out more about what we're doing. Um, Athletes of America, uh, we travel around. Athletes of America is such a great program because we travel around with faith, faith-built faith programs already built in. And we're seeking to create a new sports culture of athletes to enter the sports arena as leaders, not followers. So when they step in, not just in their home, they can step into schools, they can step into um, community centers, they can step into prisons and be a role model. Because you got to remember this, man, when that pipe busts, we all get wet. What you mean, Frank? Yeah, we stay in gated communities, I stay in gated communities, I ain't going to never touch me, that ain't going to never touch me, but it, guess what? It'll touch your kids. It may not touch your kids, it may touch your grandkids. And what will you say when your grandkid look you in the face and say, Papa, I heard this happened over there. What did you do? Uh, you got this money. You're doing all this great stuff. Did you help? What will be your answer when Papa get asked that question? Because you got to remember when the pipe busts, we all get wet. Thank you guys for joining us. Can you thank them for joining us? Um, thank you. Let's pray for him. Father God, thank you for our brothers joining us. Thank you for their testimony. God, thank you that you are the hero of the story of their life. And God, we thank you that uh, they now have relationship with their own kids and their own sons. And God, I just ask in Jesus' name that they'd have a great relationship one day with their grandkids and their grandsons. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to give them opportunities to speak and to share and to bless. And God, I pray that you would bless them and their families for sharing their time with us in Jesus' name. Amen.